So welcome, Greg. I am really glad to have you on the show. Um, I'm really interested in the topic that you uh, that you have for us. So why don't you just uh, lead us off and, and introduce uh, secular growth? Thanks a lot, John. Uh, so I wanted to today talk to you about open quantum systems. And I'm going to introduce them kind of in a slightly unconventional way uh, by basically telling you guys what is secular growth and how that ties into open quantum systems and the way in, in which open quantum systems solves these types of problems. So uh, secular growth is a purely mathematical problem that occurs when somebody's trying to solve problems using perturbation theory. So as everyone probably is aware, perturbation theory is basically a way of solving a system when we know some exact solution and we're perturbing weakly around it in some small parameter. So I want to introduce this concept by uh, first demonstrating this for just a mathematical problem. So uh, in this equation here, uh, we've got a differential equation. Uh, it's, it's a time event dependent function, which depends on the time t. And we're going to try and solve it uh, for all times t, and where g is going to be some small parameter. So this turns out to be a really simple uh, differential equation to solve, but it kind of demonstrates what's the problem very clearly. Uh, so we're going to think of this as an, initial, as an initial value problem. So there's going to be some initial condition that we're arbitrarily going to just set that at time t equals zero, uh, the function is zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that this, uh, this parameter g is some really small number. And so we're going to assume that perturbation theory applies. What this means uh, exactly in this context is we're going to look for some solution, which is basically just a series in uh, this small parameter G. So here we're basically expanding F, which is a function of T and G naively. And we're just going to think of it as a series in G where all the coefficients are some time dependent function. So F0, F1 and F2 are all functions that we're going to start to try to look for here now. So when we plug this into our original differential equation, um, what we're going to do is uh, find that we've got various powers of g on each side of the equation when, we're plug when we plug this part of the solution in. And basically by comparing each power of g on, each, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, you can write out a bunch of differential equations which are decoupled. So uh, that's what we've got written here. Um, so F0, the time derivative of F0, for example, is going to be equal to zero. And the initial condition doesn't depend on G at all. So we know that F0 is going to start out at zero, given the initial condition we started out with. Then it's very simple, easy to see that this is going to give us a solution of F0 is equal to zero for all times. So we got to go to the next order in the perturbation series. So the next differential equation we see is that basically the time derivative of F1 is equal to one minus F0. And there's going to be an initial condition of F1, which starts out at zero also, basically because our initial condition had no G dependence in it either. And so this is where things start to get a little more interesting. Well, we, we can solve this equation. We already know what F0 is, it's just zero. So what we've got at the end of the day for this uh, perturbation is some differential equation where the time derivative of F1 is equal to one with some initial condition F0. And this is something pretty much anybody who knows calculus can find. The answer is F1 of T is equal to T. And now that's basically our first term in the series that we've found. And we can repeat this process for every function fj uh, of t in the series. Um, but the whole point of perturbation theory is that for small g, we should be able to trust this solution, just the first few terms in our series, and it should be a really good approximation for our uh, exact solution to this problem. So let's just trust that for small g, this first order perturbation is uh, going to give a good approximation. And so, what do we get is we find that to leading order, 
our solution is GT plus some stuff that's ordered G squared or higher. So now what you notice here about the solution, this is a particular type of differential equation in which this happens, is that this solution blows up at very late times, basically when T gets to be very, very large. So um, we're, yeah, we're, this, this thing is just blowing up to infinity. And this is the problem of secular growth. So it's basically saying that when we wait long enough, when T gets big enough, we're not gonna have some small correction anymore to our uh, original problem. We're gonna have something that's blowing up on us at very late times. This, is, and, this sort of has to do with some like, there's some type of typical time scale here where this approximation sort of breaks down where G times T is somehow too large. Is that what's happening here? Exactly. So the kind of the point here is that we can trust this solution when GT is something very small. Then perturbation theory tells us the right answer. But it's it's there's some time scale where this breaks down. It's and it's that's basically when the time gets to be order one over G or even larger. And um, so, and I've cooked up this problem that it's very simple. It's actually the original problem we solved with is actually very simple to solve. It's just the solution is one minus e to the minus g t. So there's this exponential damping that goes on with the solution. And the point, that, as, as you just rightly pointed out, John, is that when GT is something small, we can expand this. And to leading order, what we find is that we've got something that goes like GT. Mm. So what, what this is telling us is that the perturbation theory is basically just giving us the Taylor series of the exact solution in this problem. And it's telling us we can trust perturbation theory, but just not until, uh, just for relatively early times. So there's uh, some pictures to go along with it. So uh, in this plot here, uh, we've plotted what's the exact solution, with the, which is the orange orange line. And you can see that's kind of exponentially falling off. And the approximation is just some straight line, which, which has a slope G. And you'll see that they kind of meet each other very well at early times, but then they depart rather quickly for late times. And here I've got a more dramatic demonstration of this breakdown. Uh, when we start looking at times which are of order um, t to, to be order 100. So, um, uh, this, so this problem is generically called secular growth. And um, so historically, it comes from the Latin word seculum, which means century. And this, this is basically supposed to underline that this is an issue with perturbation theory that occurs on very long time scales. And this is just a mathematical problem. And there's not, I've not connected the, this to physics yet at all, uh, but this is a very useful thing to know about whenever you're trying to solve something in a, a differential equation in some small parameter. Uh, so there's some really great lectures about this topic available on YouTube by Steven Strogatz, which uh, we've got in the YouTube description below. Okay, so we've introduced the idea of secular growth, but this seems maybe just like a bit of a convoluted problem with that happens when you're trying to solve some differential equation. But so why does, what does this have to do with physics? Well, the point is, is that in physics, uh, in pretty much any field that you encounter, we're using perturbation theory uh, and especially in quantum mechanics, where um, basically we're, we're expanding in some small parameter about some solution that we know the answer to. So, um, kind of why why do we how do we get around this late time issue so there's a really nice way to uh kind of begin explaining how this all works is by considering the example of a um decay rate problem essentially so you have some amount n some amount n of particles in your system and they're going to decay into some products and the way we basically talk about this uh, process in which the decay happens is we calculate a decay rate called gamma, typically in the literature. And um, we could be talking about any sort of types of species of particles, um, like atoms or, or subatomic particles. So the idea with uh, exponential decay laws is that we start out with some number n of particles in our system at time t naught. And we believe we trust this exponential decay law where the particles break down into its products. And uh, the question is, well, if gamma is something we're calculating in perturbation theory, 
So we expect it to be some series in G, exactly like the function f we just talked about. Why is it that, um, uh, uh, why, why do we trust exponential decay law at all? Shouldn't we be looking at a perturbation series? And the answer to this question is that we trust an evolution equation much more than we just trust the perturbation series. And this is the spirit of what I'm going to say about open quantum systems later on. So here in this case, we've got an evolution equation where the rate of change of n is proportional to itself. And we think of gamma as the constant of proportionality there, basically. So, and we're calculating gamma perturbably as I've been going on and on about. And so let's see what happens when we calculate this in perturbation series. We're going to have something very similar happen as we did earlier. Um, we have some initial condition where at time t naught, we have n naught particles that we start out with. And uh, if we work to first order in perturbation series, basically we find that there's a, we get the answer that n of t is approximately n naught times one minus gamma uh, times t minus t naught and uh, plus higher order terms in the series. And as you can guess, we're gonna get this secular growth problem here. Basically, whatever T times gamma gets very, very large compared to the initial time T naught, we're gonna get this linear growth happening again. So the idea here is we can only trust this perturbative solution for times where gamma times T minus T naught is a very, very small number. Otherwise we have the secular growth issue. So, but the point here is that because we have this evolution equation, we can solve it at any point along the time domain that we'd like. So we could pick some other time, let's say uh, where we'd start at some time, let's say T1 or T2, and we can set up some initial condition there. And we can do the same process. And we find some other perturbation series, which has this linear growth for very late times, but matches the appropriate curve um, for early enough times. And the point is because we trust these perturbative solutions everywhere across the whole entire time domain, we can kind of stitch these together, even though we don't know gamma exactly. And the point is that we can then see that there is this exponential decay law that we can trust, even though gamma is just some perturbatively calculated thing. So this is the idea of a late time resummation. And where I'm headed towards is uh, what are called master equations, which basically give us this tool when studying open quantum systems. But before we study open quantum systems, I need to explain why do we think that perturbation theory suffers secular growth issues in quantum mechanics at all.